Okay. Welcome everybody again. Okay, so a lovely, lovely Washington morning. <laughs> All the leaves. That's California. All the leaves are brown <laughs> and the sky is gray. <laughs> it doesn't happen that much in California, but anyway, I'm just sad that the rain and wind is knocking all those beautiful leaves off the trees. Yeah. I got my new Yeti, my new Yeti um, coffee mug that was in my pastor appreciation yeah. basket. Oh, wow. <laughs> so once again, thank you uh, to you guys. You went over the top in graciousness and support. We are overwhelmed by that. And so thank you. You overwhelmed us. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, that's very special. Um, let's see. Plugging away, keep playing, praying for the nominating committee <laughs> um, as we work to get ready for the congregational meeting. The budget is done and out for you to look at. So if you want to look at that, um, that's there, just FYI. Um, yeah, and so I think any other announcements for the good? Yes, yeah, so Dick Bernhardt, if you didn't know, did, did pass away. Um, but last Friday. So um, he died at Martha Mary, I believe, in his, uh, in his chair. Uh, he had, uh, Bob Breen had seen him, I think, the day before with communion. Um, Darcy had, you know, given him some, she was, she's working at Martha right. Mary now, and so she had had a good, good visit with them. And so, yeah, so, and we, I know there's a graveside that's happening it's happening way up in Bellingham, I think, um, is where he'll be laid to rest. But then we'll have a memorial service here in December. Um, so, and I believe there's a viewing today. At two, uh, yeah, I don't know. It probably shouldn't have said wake. It's mainly a viewing. That's my understanding. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's some... Um, some just, uh, you know, FYI um, things. Um, Letty Davidson's service is a week from Saturday. George Gillis's service is a week from tomorrow. So those are some. And then this Sunday for uh, All Saints Sunday, we, we decided to go back a little further than we typically do of one year. We decided to kind of go back to the COVID kind of what the shutdown kind of because um, a lot of people in the congregation, even though we often say, I know everybody in the congregation. No, you don't. <laughs> it's a big congregation. And so um, a lot of people hear the names, but they don't have the name with the face. And so um, I had a lot of requests like, man, I don't see people and I just didn't know them that well. Did they pass? So, you know, so so we're going to go back. So that's the FYI, we're going to be putting pictures up this year um, because a lot of times we say names and people don't know who it was. You know, most people do, but not everybody. So we're going to do a name and we have about 30 people that we're going to hold since COVID started um, that we'll have up. So it'll be a, an emotional but really important Sunday. We'll have the candles up where you can go up and light a candle um, in remembrance of someone. So, and I'm going to preach on the widow's might, which is the text for the day. It's not All Saints Sunday text, but uh, I wanted to preach on the widow's might and the saints. So, so there you go. I think you are up to speed. <laughs> um, Please. Next Thursday is Yes, thank you, Doug. I would have been in big trouble. So I am gonna that is a holiday for staff, believe it or not, in the church. Veterans Day is Veterans Day. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, today again, just let me remind you that the only problem with our new system is you guys have trouble hearing each other. So when you talk because we're taking our masks for uh, for eating and stuff and drinking 
if you want to take your mask off and say great otherwise just definitely speak out you know really project because it's people in-house that find uh, find it hard to hear each other of course you don't have any trouble hearing me <laughs> big, big noisy me so um so yeah so now okay so that was a good reminder for that and then doug mentioned next thursday is veterans day the office is closed it's an official holiday for me i guess and so i i think i'm going to take it so so we won't have class next thursday okay yes yeah uh next thursday uh, in honor of veterans day the scout troop is going to do the flag retirement ceremony here at the gathering place so. yep yeah so if you have an american flag that needs to be properly um what would you say retired. retired there you go thank you um the scouts will be doing that so okay okay jim slade is neat waiting to get in there we go for some reason i'm having some allergies here it's truly just allergy <laughs> um, yeah oh, I Okay, so I think with that, it's time to study the Bible and get into Luke. So I'll get, a, I'll get our scriptures up for you. Um, here we go. And those of you at home, I'm on the top right, if you want to put as many people on the top right as possible or however you want to do it, that's, I kind of make a space there on the screen. So um, let me open us with a prayer and we'll get rolling. Gracious and loving God, thank you so much for all the people here, for all the people at home, that we can do this hybrid experience. It's so awesome. And thank you for the gift of this, that we can be in your word together. It's so important to hear and read scripture together. And then our Facebook folks and those um, watching or listening to the recording. Bless us all with your spirit that this time is helpful and fruitful for our faith and our journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, I just, we've already read this, but I wanted to head back because we did Zachariah's prophecy last week. Um, all who heard them pondered them and said, what then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. So this is when John the Baptist, I believe was um, named. What will become of this child, John the Baptist? And in essence, as we go on now and we get the birth of Jesus, Mary ponders everything in her heart. What will this child become? What is this child going to do and be? And so um, after the birth of Jesus, as we scroll down, we're going to be at verse 21 of chapter 2. Um, we're answering that question. Who is Jesus? What's he going to become? What's this about? Um, Mary has been told everything, but still she's pondering it in her heart. I can't imagine it could all sink in. And just like that beautiful modern uh, song, Mary, did you know, you know, <laughs> says. Um, so she pondered everything. So then we're going to, uh, I'll set you up ahead of time. So then you would think that now that the Son of God is born into the world, there would be all kinds of pomp and circumstance and all kinds of special things and red carpets and everything. No, he's going to be named eight days later and circumcised just like every other Jewish boy was. Nothing out of the ordinary. So after eight days had passed, it was time to be circumcised the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. It's open. I don't know why people are, it's sticking evidently. If you hit the wrong side, it doesn't open. Yeah. I always open the right side. <laughs> there you go. So, so um, he's named. We've talked about Jesus's name before. Iesus in Greek 
What's the Hebrew behind this? Come on, somebody. You remember? Joshua. Good, Kathy. Yeshua. And that is the Joshua of the Old Testament. It means one who saves. So Jesus and Joshua, it's the same name, Yeshua. And so Jesus Christ is Yeshua HaMashiach. Mashiach. Um, Jesus the Messiah. Mashiach being anointed. So, so he's named Jesus. And that was a very common name. Joshua was a famous guy and you know you're gonna so um it's not an unusual name although it's extremely significant so then we move right he's just he's named no big no big hubble blue no big you know boom all right and we're gonna we're gonna cover some ground today i think we'll see when the time came for their purification according to the law of moses they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So um, let me uh, do a different share screen over here and we'll put up here. I'll have to hide all you guys for the moment, put you up here. Um, so this is, uh, I thought I had a, oh, I know what I did, wrong thing. Let's, let's go over here, this one's, this one's the one I want. So um, here you can see the temple the, um, reconstruction of what it is very likely to have looked like. Um, and so these are the altars outside the Holy of Holies, and a priest would go in and then only once a year into the Holy of, of Holies area. So um, this is the, uh, the altar, slaughter tables, the animals would be slaughtered here and offered. Um, women's courtyard, Gentiles courtyard is outside of this. Um, so they could be in the temple, but not in the inner part. So this would be sometimes the priest courtyard and, and place where men could go. <laughs> so they had all of these divisions, but Joseph and Mary go up into this place to do what the law, um, what the law wants them to do and says for them to do. So he gets named in an ordinary way and he gets, uh, and they go up to do the same, you know, all the dedication and all the, the offerings you know, the firstborn, let's see if I can put up a different, uh, get Luke. It's, it's interesting that the naming is in a, not at the same time as the, as the uh, presentation in the temple. How so? Um, NIV footnote says, um, uh, following the birth of a son, the mother had to wait 40 days before going to the temple to offer sacrifice or purification. So within 40 days after the birth, whereas the naming was on the eighth, eighth day. Not a big deal. Interesting. Yeah, 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 good. I didn't even zero into any of that. So you guys have other footnotes on that? I want to try and get to my ESV here. Okay, make it bigger so everybody can see it. Let's see. I was hoping they would give me a little. The ESV is sometimes really good with little. Uh, just give me a sec here. Anyway, so we can we can research the laws of Moses here behind this, but the 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 firstborn was specially dedicated to the Lord, and so a pair of turtle doves um, 
or two young pigeons. Now, the, so, so they go up in to do this um, dedication, um, which evidently was perhaps a little different than what was typical. Um, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Ah, let me get the Greek out of here. Whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in to the Spirit, he came, and he came in before he had seen the Lord. Oh, come on, Bill. And he came in the Spirit, in the Spirit, okay, into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said. So Simeon, uh, this righteous person waiting for the consolation of Israel, I think this is an important phrase, and we've talked about that. What is redemption look like? How does it affect Israel? And how does it affect the whole world? Um, this is this is a issue we've been talking about and thinking about uh, so far in Luke as we've heard these prophecies and these songs from Zechariah and Mary, uh, the Magnificat. What is what are they expecting to happen in the Messiah? And that's like a open question that just keeps getting held up. And so so Simeon, somebody that's looking for the consolation of Israel. Um, I don't know what that would be, but you would think it'd have something to do with getting rid of the Romans. I don't know. <laughs> or having independence. We don't know. Um, but the Holy Spirit had said, communicated to him that he would not see death before the Lord's Christ would come. So um, he came in the spirit into the temple and sees Jesus. And he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, uh, what do you think Mary and Joseph were thinking at this point? Like, give me back my kid. No, no, they, it was a different era than today. You know, <laughs> can I hold your baby? No, no, you can't. Um, so these words are going to be tremendously familiar to all those who grew up in the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church or Episcopal Church. Now, Lord, now. You are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Um, Nuc Diminis, I think is the Latin in your liturgy. Um, did you guys, does this ring a bell? A lot of you sing this, a lot of you have this in the liturgy, Ethel May, yeah. Um, it used to be one of those standard texts that you sang every Sunday. Um, it had to be the these and those. Yes, yes. Now, now let us thou, now thou, let us thou departest in peace, yeah. So why would we um, sing, why does that land in our liturgy? Um, well, we with Simeon have now seen the salvation, that he was the first uh, to recognize it, to say it, uh, not really to recognize it, but the first to proclaim it in the temple for sure. Um, and so now we always go back to that and, and say, you know what, we can join Simeon in his song. Um, Simeon, we can depart in peace because we've seen now we don't talk about, we don't sing it necessarily about our own death like Simeon was. We talk, we sing it, you know, as the service is ended, you know, let, let, we, let us depart. Our eyes have seen our salvation. Um, so I also think there's a, remember how we've talked about uh, realized eschatology, uh, which means fancy word eschaton and ology study of so study of the end. So has the salvation really happened yet? Has Jesus died on the cross? Is he raised from the dead? No, but he's there 
the baby Jesus is in his arms. And so he says, hey, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. So he's kind of saying it ahead of time. Um, the end is happening ahead of time, even as he looks at this child. Um, and I think we live in that same tension. We've seen the salvation, but it's already happened. It's true, but it's not yet. We live in that in-between kind of space. So, um, so I love this. These are beautiful words. Um, you know, I want to go back. Does anybody in their Bible have where this, is there an Old Testament connection here? I think it's Isaiah. Um, I don't know why my, my references aren't showing up here. Let's see, cross references. Isaiah 42, 6. Let's check, look at Isaiah 42, 6. Let's go over here. Isaiah 42, 6. Yeah, so um, I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out of prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, the new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is one of those servant songs in Isaiah. So um, a light, you know, my right, you know, the light to the Gentiles. Barb, you have others? Yeah, 40, Isaiah 49, 6. 49, 6. I, I want to get to the, I think there's one. There's one Isaiah 8, 15. And Isaiah 40. I mean, yeah, this is what I want. Yeah. So. Um, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised and whored by the nations, the slave of rulers, kings shall see and stand up, princes, they shall prostrate themselves because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Again, another servant song. I don't know if you remember um, our sermon series at the end of the month, but we looked at one of the parts of I this middle part of Isaiah, we call them servant songs. And there's this mysterious figure of the servant, my servant whom I've chosen. And we get the famous Isaiah 53 where, you know, he's stricken, he's beat down, the sins are, our sins are put on him. You know, he was, he's, his stripes have healed us. You know, so the suffering servant we call. And so this is in the midst of those is a vision that God's redemption is going to go to all the world. Now, how do you think, let's go back here to, to Simeon. Um, how do you think a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel? What do you think? Is Simeon qu quoting enough of Isaiah to say, yes, I'm excited to see the salvation of the Lord because now the Gentiles are going to get to be brought in too, along with Israel. Is that what he's saying here? I don't know. Now, I know that's what the servant song says in Isaiah. There's definitely, just like, let's go back to Abraham and Sarah. God blessed them to what? Be a blessing, Ethel May says. Absolutely. Yes, glory. Well, in, uh, in Isaiah 40, verse 5, it says, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed in all mankind. And there will see it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Yeah, so all mankind will see it there. And then in these other ones, a light to the Gentiles. Does that mean that they're, the Gentiles are going to be 
saved, just like the, is, is the nation of Israel? We become God's people, yeah. What is John, what is, uh, I think it's Jesus that says, or John says, God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones, yeah. right? Okay, so, and you're, you may be going, where is Pastor Bill going? <laughs> what is he talking about? Um, if I was a Jewish person in this day and age, hearing Simeon, and I heard that this baby, this, this child was going to be salvation and light to the Gentiles, I would not be excited about that. Why? Why? Why wouldn't I be excited while I eat a piece of cheese? <laughs> Why wouldn't I, as a Jewish person, be excited for the Gentiles to go? Well, the Gentiles haven't been very nice to the Israelites <laughs> over the years. Right. They've been persecuted by them. The Gentiles have been persecuting and punishing the Jewish people for hundreds of years. Damn, or were you raising your hand? No, okay, I thought I, thought I saw a hand over here. Um, yeah, think of, so let's just go back and review your history. Alexander the Great, the Greeks came in after the people were able to go back home the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem, the temple and everything, take them off to the Tigris and Euphrates River. They are there for 50 years. Cyrus of Persia comes along and beats up the Babylonians and he has a whole different philosophy. And he says, okay, you guys can go home. So a lot of the Jewish people, the diaspora, they didn't go home. They just, they had good lives. They kept going where they were, but a lot of them went back home, back to what we call the Holy Land, back to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem's a mess, has no wall, has no temple, everything's in ruins, but they start to rebuild. And it's no more do they get it rebuilt and their wall around, that's Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, that here come the Greeks, Alexander the Great, conquers the whole world in essence almost. And after Alexander the Great, he splits up his territory into four sections. And so the Greeks take over. And one of those, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth, Antiochus means, basically his name means a revelation of God. That's, that's you think he had a big head? <laughs> this is my name. Well, he sets up worship of Zeus in the temple and brings unclean animals in and just horrible. This is when you hear some of the apocalyptic stuff in the Old Testament, a lot of scholars think that's what's being talked about. So that starts one series after another. So the Greeks are there. And then eventually, though, um, the, there's a revolt, the Maccabean revolt. That's the Hanukkah thing that, you, we, that Jewish people still celebrate. The, Mac, the Maccabees have a kind of guerrilla warfare and they kick out the Greeks and they get independence for a short while and they get most of the territory that the King David had. And everybody's like, yay, but there's a lot of internal fighting. <laughs> that never happens in politics, right? People are just like, I, I wanna share my power. I wanna work together. You know, no. So, that weakens them, and who comes along but the Romans. And the Romans, they um, have a pretty, they keep everybody down, the peace of Rome, right? And, um, but, but <clears throat> the Holy Land is thoroughly Hellenized, that is um, immersed in the Greek culture. And so the people are, They've been under the thumb of one regime after another. They've been looked down upon. They've been um, belittled, et cetera, et cetera. They haven't had their independence. They haven't had their say. And human beings like to have their say. Our own country, you know, hey, we're tired of paying all these taxes without representation and off we go, right? So um, it's, you can think it's even stronger for them. So they are not excited. And I don't blame them. 
I'm not being anti-Semitic in saying this. If I was a Jewish person in the first century and I heard Jesus saying, hey, I've come to bring a light to the Gentiles, or I heard Simeon, I would be like, uh, can we get someone else to speak? You know? <laughs> I think we need to immerse ourselves in that. So when Simeon you know, says this beautiful, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So for sure glory to Israel. Now, the ambiguity here, although if you go back to Isaiah, you'd say, yeah, it's going to include the Gentiles. I'm not a light for revelation to the Gentiles. How do we know that this isn't, hey, you Gentiles, we were right all along? You see where I'm going? See what I'm saying? I'm not saying that's what Simeon thought. I'm just saying, hmm. Um, when Jesus preaches his first sermon in the Gospel of Luke, coming up, <laughs> he quotes Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he goes through, and it's going to be um, to the Gentiles. But he stops. There's in Isaiah, there's a spot where there's going to be retribution on the Gentiles, and he stops. When we get there, we'll look at it. But and then everybody's like, wow, that's really cool. Um, that's so powerful. And then he says, Oh, you know, he almost picks a fight with them. And then he talks about two stories in the Old Testament. What stories does he bring up? The widow of Zarephath, was she a Jew? No. Naaman, the, Syr the Syrian, the, the commander who got healed, was he a Jew? No. He quotes two stories from the Old Testament where God brought in and healed people outside the camp of God's holy people. And what do the people want to do then? Do they say, hmm, wow, that's interesting, Jesus. I'll, we'll think about that. No, they try and take him and throw him off a cliff. So I think we, we read this and we go, oh, that's so cool, that's great. I think, um, I think that we're not so sure about that at this point. And I don't know if Simeon, when he talks about this, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, as we look at it now, it's like, yes, thanks be to God, we have now the revelation of God too. The gifts and the call of God have come to us. We are not the... the the sacred people, the people of the covenant, the people who have the law, um, and that's irrevocable, the Apostle Paul says in Romans uh, 11, uh, chapter 11. But, but yet, so now we get included, but I'm not sure yet. I'm not so sure this isn't, hey, Gentiles, look, we were right all along, and you guys are toast. I don't know, okay? All right, let's keep going. Questions, comments? Okay, excellent. Okay, and the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Now that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, Mary, the angel told Mary. <laughs> but still, I mean, we're human beings and it's like, wow, is it really true? Haven't you had something like, you know, that it's been so wonderful, but then time goes on and you just go, I guess it's really true, you know? We need as human beings confirmation of, <laughs> we, need, we need words to keep coming to us. It's like Mary, well, the, the angel told her, why doesn't she, what is she set for life? No, she's a human being. She needs God to keep giving her gifts, to keep, you know, she needed to hear this too. I think about us on Sunday morning. I, I'm just amazed that, that some people think, you know, I've been to church once in my life and I think I got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you have a stronger faith than me. I, I, if I don't get that word preached to me every Sunday and in, every day in between, I'm not sure I'm gonna make it. I need that word to keep working on me, like water on rock, you know? I mean, just keeps shaping and shaping and molding. Yeah. Yeah, I can just always, wonder what Mary was, how Mary was thinking this was going to turn out. Yes. So Simeon might have 
it was giving her a new perspective on just really what was going to happen with the sex. Yeah, yeah. That he's going to be a light to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Which may be to her. And salvation, you know. Yeah, maybe to her. her at the time, she probably wasn't thinking of his mind. Right. Because he's the Messiah. That's what she's been told. She hasn't been told he's going to suffer on the yeah. cross. Yeah. That comes in the next couple of verses. Here we go. Yeah. So, yes, that's right. So, so the fa child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Yeah, like, wait a minute. Shouldn't this be all flowery and wonderful at this point? It's like, it's, Glory to your people, Israel. And it's like, wow, that's cool. And then, what are you talking about? The fall and rising. Falling and rising. Now, this is really interesting. It doesn't say rising and falling. It says falling and rising. And to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and the sword will also pierce your own soul too. In other words, you're going to see it's, it's going to be painful. That, that the Messiah, the, the Christ being the Messiah, it isn't going to be just a lovely, triumphant, woohoo, everything goes smoothly. There's going to be pain and suffering and loss um, and, and opposition. Opposition. What are we, what's your thoughts? Anybody thoughts at home? Comments? Kathy, well, please. I was just going to say that um, the thing that, that is mentioned here by Simeon that wasn't mentioned. I mean, even going back to before where it said this article about what he said was, you know, before they said he was going to be the son of the Most High and he was going to be given the throne of David. So the thing about the Gentiles, I think, is probably what they were modeling. Is but, because the Gentiles, you know, mentioned that is, right. is new. So the, the marveling is the Gentile being included. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It also says, you know, in verse 35. Talk real loud. Talk real loud. So that the thoughts are in verse 35. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Nobody's going to hide. Everybody's going to know. Yeah. I mean, it, it, eventually, everybody's going to know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. <laughs> <laughs> probably when you think about um this you there you know again trying to immerse ourselves in the first century judaism um there was a lot of division amongst the jewish different groups who was sincere who was really authentic you know we've got the essenes living out by the dead sea probably in other places that had just said hey jerusalem's so corrupt we're not going to have anything to do with it. And so when God's salvation comes, there's going to be this revealing. You know? um, and we hear that in the New Testament about this, the final judgment. That, um, and then what does 1 John say? I think we say it most Sundays. Um, you know, uh, that wasn't it, no. Um, uh, with whom no all... No secrets are hid. We we say that. You know, you look, you can pretend before other people, but God knows. <laughs> God knows. I'll never forget, I had someone say, I don't get why you do this confession every Sunday. Um, I mean, just people come, you know, they come every Sunday and they say the words and then you forgive them. I mean, you know, do they really mean it or do they, you know, I mean, is it just a you know, they, for, they came from a tradition that, you know, repetitive stuff is meaningless. You know, 
you, it's got to come from your heart and be extemporaneous and, and all these set things. I had a pastor once tell me, though, he says, I'm not sure I've said a prayer until I said it 40 or 50 times. In the sense of that I've really gotten it, you know, I mean, so I just told him, I said, look, um, God knows what's in everybody's heart. God knows if they're just going through the motions or not. How do you know that they're going through the motions? Aren't you judging? <laughs> um, and uh, so anyway, um, yeah, no, no secrets. But what about the opposition side of this, folks? What does that say to us? That God's intervention in the world is going to meet with opposition. Uh, what does Paul say in one of his letters? That the cross is a... is folly to the Greeks. Why? Well, a God is never going to be put on a cross. That's, that's no God at all. And Jewish folks, cursed be everyone who hangs on the tree from Deuteronomy. So our Messiah can't be crucified. So, so th there's going to be a falling and a rising, though, of many in Israel. So that so I don't know exactly what Simeon's saying, but in my own read of the rest of the New Testament, I think when God comes to us, there is a death. There is a falling. The old self, the old Adam, the old Eve needs to be put to death. And, and the old Adam rebels against what God is doing in Christ. You know? Says, I don't need any of this cross stuff. I don't need a savior to die. Give me some little help. Give me some rules. Fine. Give me some religious stuff to do so I can say, look at me, how cool I am. You know, I, but tell me that I'm completely bankrupt and I am lost without this person dying for my sins. Don't want that. You know, again, it's just like we talked about with the difference between mercy and kindness. Like when my brother would put me down and make me say mercy, and I would not do it until my arm was broken. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say I need mercy. <laughs> you know, well, that's the old Adam and Eve. Don't, I don't need mercy. You give me a little help. That's fine. You give me a little chores to do. I'll do it. But don't, you know, that it's a blow. It's a dying and a rising, and it's offensive. Um, okay, I'm preaching again. Um, I want to show you something here, if I can. Let's see. I don't know why this is up here and not going away. Um, I, I grabbed a quote from Luther. Here we go. Let's see if I can find it. My trouble is I get lost in Luther. I start. Okay. So this is what Luther says I, about this little verse here. It is inevitable that Christ is the source of every offense and the target of every attack. So Simeon declared when he addressed Mary in the second chapter of St. Luke, behold, he is set for the fall of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. They will test their strength on him, but they will be dashed to the ground. For it is he who seizes the devil and crushes his head. Then the devil in turn takes hold of him and bruises his heel. Remember that goes back to Genesis where the offspring of Eve will crush the serpent's head, but the serpent will bruise his heel. In this world, the struggle will never cease between Christ and the devil. The struggle in which the seed of the woman will crush the head of the snake and the snake will bruise his heel. But Christ and his own have held the field thus far. They will continue to do so, upholding his word. Um, that Luther sees that it's the proclamation of the gospel, the word Christ Jesus, the word made flesh, law and gospel, you know, the preaching of the word that the devil cannot stand. The devil is after. And so, so when Jesus comes into the world, our old turned inward self, the devil, the devil's self, rushes in you know um so should we ever expect it to be hard to be the church 
Sorry, I know I'm stating the obvious. You know, I, get, I know you've probably heard me say this before, but somewhere Luther said, you know the gospel's being preached right. You know how? The devil comes up and sets a chapel next door. Because you are a threat. So Luther could even go to the point of saying he called, bleep this, you're, Luther loved to, I think, just stir us up, but he said, the devil is my great comforter. <laughs> was he had he lost it by then he, he clearly at times lost it <laughs> he said some awful things but no why he said that is he said when i know the devil's coming after me i know i must be doing something right so he said the devil's my great comforter because when he felt that oppression happened and that weight and that all the trouble and struggle um he said well Obviously, I'm doing something that's got the devil's attention. Well, you preach the word and you're going to keep having opposition. Um, oppos and he talks about the devil here, but we could just as well put our old turned inward self too. Um, does that make sense? Okay, very cool. Let's get back. Let's get some more text going here. We got to keep moving. Um, so this is interesting and i so there's opposition the the rising and falling of many mary mary's soul will be pierced too and that's so true now okay we're not done there is also a prophet anna the daughter of fenua the tribe of asher she was of a great age having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage then as a widow to the age of 84. Do you know how old that is back then? 84? I mean, it was 84, but still, you didn't live to 84 in the first century. You were fortunate to make it into your 30s. Okay, So she's 84. That'd be like 120 or something now. I don't know what it'd be. But anyway, that's probably not true. But anyway, certainly over 100. So she is great stature. And then as a widow, she never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. So you remember that, that uh, diagram I put up for you, where there was the, the Gentiles were on the outside, then there was the court of the women, where the women could be. So, so Anna's just there all the time, night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Well, the people were in Jerusalem, so they're looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. But again, you see, I, we just, what's striking me as we're into the beginning of Luke is to me, what does it mean? What does redemption mean is a big question mark. I mean, what does that look like? What's the, how's that gonna get fleshed out? How's that going to be brought into reality? There's lots of expectations about what redemption would mean. First, you got to get rid of those darn Romans. And first, you got to get rid of the Romans. You know, I don't know. You know, I, we don't hear that said, but that's got to be in the minds of a lot of the Jewish people. And the redemption of Jerusalem, why would Jerusalem need redeemed? The Jewish people have their temple, they have their city, they have their everything set up. It might be because of how corrupt everything had gotten. The chief priest was appointed by Caesar. The Roman emperor appointing our chief priest? Maybe Anna was like, when she's thinking about redemption of Jerusalem, she might be thinking about clean this place up, you know? And Jesus himself comes in there and he turns the tables over, you know? So, so there, I'm not saying that it's just a spiritual redemption. I'm just saying, Question mark. I guess we need to keep reading. <laughs> I, need, I guess we need to keep going. Now, remember how Luke starts his gospel? What did Luke do? Inasmuch as many have undertaken to have given an orderly account to you, O Theophilus, I too have studied everything carefully. In essence, he says, I went out and interviewed everybody. Nobody else tells us about Anna. Isn't it cool? 
that Luke tells us about Anna. She was overlooked. Matthew didn't talk about her. You know, John begins John's gospel with the beautiful Christ hymn, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word. So they're all beautiful, they're all great, but in God's infinite wisdom, the evangelist Luke goes out and interviews people, finds out all this stuff about Mary and Zachariah and Simeon. We don't hear anything about Simeon either in any other gospel. And, and this 84-year-old woman, night and day, praising God, devoted, looking for God's salvation, and she, she begins to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So she so sees it think, too. Uh, Luke went and talked to Anna. Well, she would have been about 120. By yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he got to talk to Hannah to Anna, but I guarantee you he talked to some other people who knew her. Yeah. Yep. That's how we know about it. Um, you know, as he interviewed and asked people, and it's like, yeah, you know what happened? This happened in the temple, and this, you know. Now, I know the hypercritical scholars say it's all made up, but, you know, if you're going to go there, you might as well just, you know, throw it all in. All right, so this is cool. And any other, any comments on what Anna has to say? Any uh, commentary, any notes in your Bibles that are really cool you want to throw on? Give you a second here. I'll have some more almonds. <laughs> Well, I thought it was cool that, um, so he, Luke makes sure to mention that she's from the tribe of Asher. And so I went back to Genesis to look at that table of names um, when Jacob blesses his sons. And um, Asher's food will be uh, rich and fit for a king. So, uh, you know, she's talking about this, this child, the king, and, um, no, I mean, I don't know. You can go places with the table and the food, but um, I just thought that was kind of a cool connection. That is a cool connection. Um, that that tribe's beginning, you know, had that royal <laughs> um, connection. Here she is, you know, pointing and speaking about this, this child. Yeah. Yeah. I think... Yeah, thank you, Kim. That's that's cool. I love. I thank you for. I know you do, you do a great job looking into those names in the old in that connect because there are details that the evangelists mention, and so they got to mean something. So yeah, good. So right away, even though this is an ordinary birth in a family home in Bethlehem. No room in the guest room, so they're at back in the back in the stable. And he's named in an ordinary, normal way. He's brought to the temple, perhaps sooner than usual, but in an ordinary way, um, and a, a way right up in accord with the law. All of a sudden, a couple people take notice. Simeon and Anna. Yeah. Kathy on the bottom left. Oh, Kathy, please. Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Um, okay. I, I also think, though, that Luke spoke to Mary a lot. And, you know, it, I'm sure that when Mary went back to the temple, there would be Anna and, and so on. He got a lot of his information straight from Mary and what was going on and probably then went back in maybe and spoke to, spoke to her. You know, this isn't, yeah, yeah, it was just straightforward for him to go and, and talk to this person who had seen the baby on the same time or later, a little bit later than Simeon. Yeah, I'm, yeah, was, did Luke get to talk to Mary, the mother of Jesus, when he starts writing? I don't know, but it's certainly possible. Or someone that was close to Mary, you know. You know, absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, I can't imagine that if Mary wasn't available, was a, if Mary was available, he wouldn't have talked to her. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Kathy. So do people, um, do people take notice today um, of God's revelation in Christ Jesus? You know? We talked about this last week, so we won't go too far down this road, but I'm just still amazed that um, people don't see the forest for the trees, or what do you call that? Is that the right term? Um, that people overlook the revelation of God in Christ Jesus. They don't notice it. And Luke tells us about two people who just saw what God was doing in a baby. This, this is Christmas all over again. Bethlehem didn't come running to see, you know, Mary and Joseph and his family home, but he goes to the temple and two people looking, expecting for the redemption of Jerusalem and, and Israel and, and the world perhaps, notice. And I think that that's a part of our spiritual journey is noticing and not overlooking God's hand in our lives and in the world. And it's usually hard to see because it's usually pretty ordinary. You, we can see the spectacular things, <laughs> but the ordinary things, you know, yep. Okay, good. Please, Rick. Um, do, do we know if Luke was a Gentile or a Jew? Um, or what perspective was he writing? Right. Um, it's possible. I think when we started out, it's possible that Luke is the only Gentile writer the Gospels. in all of the oh. New Testament. Um, but I don't know that we know. He's a physician. We hear a reference about him being a physician. I don't know if Acts. Um, let's let's just take a quick. Let's just take a quick. Um, let's see if the the Bible dictionary, the Harpers, will give us a quick. Uh, let's see. He was probably a Gentile. Yeah, so the introduction, Kathy's, what does yours say, Doug? Yeah, I think we might be reading the same thing. Uh, Well-educated in Greek culture, physician by profession, companion of Paul at various times on the second missionary journey, his first imprisonment in Rome. So in Acts, we hear, which is the second volume of the Gospel of Luke, we hear that Luke was a companion of Paul, and like, and, and like it's, he, I don't think we have a definitive, but it's, likely that he was a gentile so of course he's gonna have you know he's gonna be like i want to make sure that the light to the gentiles <laughs> is out there and and proclaim so um one of the things that people will say about the gospel of luke is it's the most um inclusive i guess you could say Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners. Now he does that in other gospels too, but you've got the Roman centurion who's held up as a person of great faith. Only hear that in Luke. Um, you know, there's other, the, the preaching, the synagogue preaching where he gets, you know, that they want to throw him off a cliff. That's only in Luke. So when Jesus starts talking about including these Gentiles, so um, the thief, the, the people on the right and left of Jesus, we don't know anything about them, do we? No, we do because of Luke. Luke tells us, you know, so it seems like Luke really is like, hey, the gospel is for all these folks who were left out. Um, and, and Luke has a particular focus on that. It's there in all the gospels, but and certainly in Paul, but, and of course, Luke was a companion of Paul. Well, if he was a doctor, he's probably more detail-oriented than him. Yes, right, for sure. That's gonna help him with his investigation, 
it, you know, his method of inquiry, all of that. Yeah, yeah. So great question, Rick. Okay. Anything else on Simeon and Anna? Told you we were going to make some, get some ground here today. Um, when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. So they had been in Bethlehem, went to the temple. Maybe that's why they went early and did the law stuff, because they needed to get home. I don't know. Um, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I want to I wanna do this text. Let's see, this is verse 39. I want to put my little uh, comparison up here. Well, why would it do that? Was it was two thirty six? Was it? Did I say? No. Okay, a little further. Um, thirty nine. Thank you, Doug. So, um, how many of you have wondered what Jesus's youth was like? Come on, admit it. What was it like playing with Jesus in, the, in kindergarten? Have you heard of the infancy gospels? You, I'm so glad you guys don't watch the history. Channel. Well, I have to imagine that when they went to the wedding feast, ah. Mary already knew what he was capable of. That had to have come, I think, from some prior exposure. So I think Jesus, as he was growing up, was learning just what he was capable of. And so was Mary. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, she obviously doesn't forget. And when they get to that wedding 30 years later than what we're reading right now, or 25 years later or something like that, um, you know, she, so she, she must have observed something, right? So that's the question, Jim. So a couple hundred years after Christ, maybe 300 years after Christ, we start seeing these infancy gospels because inquiring minds want to know. You've wondered about the National Enquirer, which none of you buy, right? None of you buy that, you better not. If I come over to visit you and you get that thing out of my sight. Anyway, um, well, there was a National Enquirer in Jesus's day and it's called the Gnostic Gospels. They want more info. And so we start seeing these infancy Gospels show up that tell us what we want to know. We want to know what it was like playing with Jesus on the playground. Did he zap people? Did he heal people? Was he doing all kinds of amazing things? And I'm not disagreeing with Jim's comment that Mary had to see something in him because she still was confident and she didn't forget. But a lot of people say, well, we don't know anything about Jesus's adolescence and his upbringing. Yes, we do. It's right here. Luke went out and investigated everything, right? All he tells us about Jesus's childhood is the child grew and became strong with filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him then we're going to get one story about the boy Jesus so in all the investigation that Luke does this is what he tells us why He didn't find anything there that was worthy or needed to be said. He had an ordinary upbringing. Yes, we believe Jesus was fully human, but yet without sin, but nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. He wasn't going around and touching people and healing people. Those infancy gospels, they're hilarious to read. You should read them. At one point, he picks up a bird or a rock and he, you know, he, he does these little frivolous miracles, you know, like, ha, 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 look what I can do. You know, it's, and so 
People made stuff up. Well, Luke, the most ancient source for the boyhood of Jesus, looks at it and go, he grew and became strong and was filled with the favor of God and the favor of God was upon him. There you, you know, go. You know he was a carpenter, so he must have made some really good furniture, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Although the word for carpenter is technon, which really is not, it could be um, a craftsperson. And uh, I know Don Jukum, one of the retired pastors, when he went to Israel, says, you don't see a lot of wood there. Now, there was probably a lot more wood back in Jesus' day. What do you see when you go to the Holy Land? Who's been there? Stones, rocks. A technon could definitely be a stonemason. And so it's kind of interesting to think about when Jesus talks about, I am the cornerstone. Um, uh, he might have been, but either made a lot of good furniture or a lot of good, you know, uh, building bricks or whatever um, for building houses because that's what they used to build their houses they didn't have wood houses primarily they might have had wood roofs to put over but but you go there now you still see the structures because they were they used either basalt or the the uh what is it limestone um, um anyway so um so he just considered joseph's son he was joseph's son what it, here's another good thing when Jesus starts to do stuff, don't they, what do they say? Isn't he, isn't he just the carpenter's son, Joseph? He's doing all these amazing things. Now, if he was doing tons of miracles when he was a kid, would they have been like shocked? Well, yeah, he's been doing that since he was back in five years old. Do you remember? No, they're like, can this really be? Because his, uh, his childhood was ordinary. It was basic. It was beautiful, he matured in wisdom, he grew, but he wasn't running around doing all kinds of miracles. What is his first statement going to Mary to, oh, Jim, you mentioned Mary's thing. What, is Jesus, what does Jesus say to Mary when she says, hey, fix this up? My time hasn't come yet. So even Jesus has a sense that he hasn't been doing all kinds of miracles. But Mary says, well, yeah, it actually has come. <laughs> and Jesus doesn't. So, so he needed a little kickstart from mom. That never happens. For yeah, me, right? I, okay. Yeah, please. I, I think um, filled with wisdom is not a typical description of a child. That's more like something reserved for a more mature person. Yeah. So that, I think that gives you a hint that you know, he may not have been doing anything special, but he was very special. Yes. Just in that. Absolutely. In that, way. in that regard, Luke said he was, and that's why I wanted to look at the the other ways. Um, well, yes, time. here we go. And when he had finished everything required, no, oh, sorry. Um, Yes, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God. The child became filled with wisdom and the favor of God was, um, the grace of God was with him. The spirit, he was filled strong with the spirit. Um, so wisdom and spirit is pneuma. So, so it's uh, the, the New, King, New King James says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. But it also says filled with wisdom. Filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So, so the wisdom is filled with, you know, the source. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and let's see, uh, let's see what uh, the NIV says. Take care, Cotter. And the child grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So the favor of God, the grace of God was upon him. Um, I think he was well known amongst people as a, a, a special kid, you know, um, but it wasn't the miracle stuff that, that we want to wonder about. Like, if he was the son of God, why wasn't he just going around, you know, saying, oh, come here, um, you know, animal, I want to have a wonderful meal tonight, you know, or something. I don't know. Um, so like, oh, sorry, Kim? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to just, Stephanie kind of started it, but um, in my systematics class, we just talked about um, Jesus as the wisdom of God. And um, the, you know, 
the logos, the wisdom of God. And I know that there's other uh, texts where we talk about that word, Sophia being the spirit, the Holy Spirit. But um, is this, could this be kind of saying he became filled with Jesusness? You know, like he, he just started to come into his own as who this, who the son of God is. That is cool. Yeah, he kind of started to become who he was. Mm -hmm. um, the word here is Sophia um, underneath the, the wisdom. So filled with Sophia, filled with wisdom. And, uh, you know, John is going to talk about this uh, and make the connection of wisdom with the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And um, so, so yeah, he, he was growing into who he was, maybe. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice like it so the favor of God was upon him so so there you go there's you wanted to know what happened to Jesus when you know what his childhood was like Luke tells us exactly everything we need to know right there he probably got straight A's in carpenter school he probably he must have got straight A's <laughs> oh my goodness you know see we got to make sure he's you know exemplary <laughs> maybe he didn't maybe his dad was like you need to do this messiah thing because you're not <laughs> sorry that was that, that was that was uh uh unpious of me to say well, such a thing god has a sense of humor too. yes right yes i'm sure god does okay so next week we're at the end of our uh, hour and 15 minutes um, f 15 minutes here. Next week, we are going to hear the one story. No, not next week, the week after. Um, the week after that, we're going to hear the one story that we hear about from Jesus's before he is out being baptized in the Jordan. We're going to hear. Um, now, here's the, let's do this though to end. And this is what I was looking for because I couldn't remember. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. So now we've got this here. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So the child, as a young child, grows up. Now the boy Jesus is in the temple, and we hear this story that we're going to come back and look at. But then Luke says, and Jesus increased in wisdom. Again, I'm assuming that's Sophia. Yeah. And in years. So now he's growing up or stature, years or stature. So, so yeah, he must have been a good carpenter, you know? I mean, or he, you know, he must have excelled. Um, we can clearly see he excels in the study of the scriptures. He's there in the Father's house looking at. And in divine, so God's favor and human favor. So he was well thought of. That's what Luke says, he's well thought of. But that's all he's gonna tell us is this one story. And then we get to John the Baptist. And it's going to be cool because we're going to be in the John the Baptist right around Advent, getting prepared for the Lord. So, all right, let me close this. Uh, let me end the share. Anybody else at home? Any other thoughts to finish this off? We're good. All right. I'm sure having fun with you guys with this. This is cool. All right, let me close this in a prayer. Gracious and loving God, thank you for your word and thank you uh, for Simeon and Anna who noticed. And we pray that we will notice what you're doing among us and that we will also know that following you will encounter opposition and struggle. And we pray for your humility about that, but also your endurance and your strength that we can keep our eyes set on you in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So you guys will really be studied up on this boy in the temple. You got two weeks to do your delving in. I'm just going to come and listen to you guys. <laughs> All right. Let's see, stop.